Hello and welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. As always, I'm your host, Chris Collins. We are in the stretch run of the 2016 election. We have a primary in September, a race for Governor's Council. One of the candidates, somewhat of a political newcomer, at least to electoral politics as far as I know, Jeff Morneau. He's a Hamden County attorney. I think you're the president of the Hamden County Bar Association, correct? I am. Yeah. I am, Chris. Thanks for having me in here today to uh, talk to you and to try to educate your listeners a little bit more about myself and about this governor's council position. Thank you. You are new to uh, the the, uh, the idea of electoral politics. You're new to, at least I've never heard of you before now, um, but you're not new to the idea of, of the legal community and you're not new to Hamden County politics. For some people in Franklin County who may not know you, who is Jeff Morneau and, and why do you want this job? Well, uh, thanks, Chris, great question. Uh, as you indicated, my name's Jeff Morneau. I'm running for governor's council. A little bit in way of background, I'm from Holyoke originally. I went to Holyoke Public Schools. Uh, from there, I'm, I'm proud to say I was the first person in any generation of my family to go to college and graduate from a four-year college. I've got two, two brothers, uh, so my, my, roots, my roots are in Holyoke. I currently live in East Longmeadow with my wife, Kate, who's an educator, and I have two kids, uh, Ryan and Megan, Ryan age 12 and, and Megan age 10. So, you know, that's a little bit of my family history, my, you know, my work history. Um, is a little different. I started out, you know, after graduating from, uh, from college, I went to Providence College. And from there, uh, I was a tennis pro for a while. I traveled. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, I traveled a little bit around the world and a lot around the country uh, playing tennis. And then uh, after doing that, I came back. I came back to my community uh, in Holyoke and Hamden County and started to teach tennis to children. Um, so I did that in Holyoke and in Springfield for a couple of years. And then as a result of uh, one of the families that I was teaching tennis to, decided, uh, they kind of pushed me in and said, you know, why don't you try law school? And I, it didn't really occur to me that it would be a good career for me, but as soon as I got into it, I, I realized that I really loved it. What about the law do you love the most? I mean, what, what, what made, what, what gets you going when you think about a legal career? Helping people. Um, that's what I've dedicated my law career to. So since, you know, graduating from Western New England, I went and got a master's of law degree in labor and employment law uh, from Georgetown University. And then, uh, just like in tennis, I, I found I didn't like the big city, came back again to the community, and since then I've dedicated my entire uh, professional career, the last 15 years especially, representing uh, workers, labor unions, and consumers. So uh, I've been fighting and working for the people uh, for the last 15 years, and that's really what motivates me every day. Now, you have said, at least your campaign website touts you as the only true progressive in this race. I mean, your opponent, Mary Hurley, is much more an establishment Democrat and somewhat more of a centrist. Uh, you are very proud to be a progressive. And talk about what that means and, and how that affects your strategy in this campaign. Well, I, I think what it means in, in this particular race are, are the values that you stand for. And what I see is uh, as a progressive in this particular race where it comes to uh, judges and the legal community, is that we're looking for people who uh, can find solutions to common problems, find new solutions to common problems, um, and really find judges who are a little bit more, a little bit more active as opposed to um, inactive, people who, who look at the Constitution, who look at the laws and see ways in which um, you know, things can be changed a little bit. Um, judges have a lot of discretion, and I think they need to use that discretion wisely to make decisions that are appropriate for the people that are before them, for the issues that are before them, and for uh, the larger community and society. We've talked before about this, and I, and I want to get you to sort of talk about your, your litmus test uh, for judges, because I find it interesting. A lot of times when people are running for office, they try to avoid saying that they're in favor of, of appointing activist judges. You, however, are, are unashamed about that. You absolutely think that the best judge is someone who not only interprets the law, but also is willing to change the law if necessary. Yeah, I mean, a judge, the, the first thing a judge has to do is to follow the law. So to the extent that there is a law and there is a decision of a higher court that is clear and unequivocal, the judge has to follow the law, and I would expect a judge to do that. Um, but if the laws were so simple and the laws were so easily understandable and the laws were all so clear, we wouldn't need courts, we wouldn't need judges. Judges, wouldn't, judges in the superior court wouldn't make mistakes, judges in the appeals court wouldn't overturn them, and, and so on. So. There's a lot of, there is a lot of discretion uh, with regard to a judge, um, and I think the judges need to use that discretion uh, wisely. And when it comes to a litmus test, you know, I do have a, a litmus test, but it's primarily for 
justices that are going to be on the Supreme Judicial yeah. Court, the ones that are going to be making the large um, constitutional and societal decisions that are going to impact the community for not just this generation, but the next generation and the generation after that. And uh, those litmus tests that I have are, in my opinion, uh, true to democratic values and progressive democratic values. And that's, those are the constituents that I represent and I believe in this democratic primary um, what they're looking for. I think it's an interesting question because you've got a lot of potential case law out there that hasn't been written yet. A lot of privacy issues. I mean, obviously, we're, this is the, the era of the warrantless wiretap. Uh, there's, there's, you know, potentially uh, legalization of marijuana, and there's been not a lot of case law written about that either. So the people who go on the high court, and there have already been a number of appointments made in this term, uh, are going to have a shot at looking at some stuff that no other court ever has. So your feeling is those people have to be able to not just abide by the law and enforce the law, but also interpret it. Exactly. I mean, for example, in Massachusetts, um, we were the first on same-sex marriage. That issue had, that was a, con a constitutional issue, yeah. a core constitutional issue that impacts, um, it was going to impact at the time all society in Massachusetts. And as it turns out, it affected society all across the country as uh, it was the leading example, the leading decision. Um, and so I'm sure that when Judge Graney and Judge Spina and others took the bench, um, they didn't think they weren't thinking same-sex marriage is going to come before me. What is my decision going to be? Yeah. And that's why it's important to make sure that we get the best judges at the time because you never know what the issue is that's going to be before them. And people, like you said, they don't think about this race. They don't think about governor's council, and they don't think about judges. Um, but I found that they do when one of three things happens, Chris. Either they're going into court, then they want to know who's the judge, what's right. his or her background, where are they from. They have a friend or family member that's going to court. Or there's a big issue, some big issue that's going before the court that is important to them uh, or important to somebody that they know. And then the only th one of the only things they want to know, who's the judge, what's his or her background, you know, what prior decisions has, she, has he or she written, what governor uh, appointed that person, is it a Republican or Democrat, um, or you know what are their what are their political values, and, and then those things become important. But by that time, it's too late because the judge you get is the judge you get. You can't change the judge. Does geography matter in terms of a Supreme Court justice nominee? In other words, should there be a mix of East and West on the bench? And are you concerned that Baker, being an East governor, basically who doesn't really think much about Western Mass, will end up appointing people from the Boston area rather than someone out here? Well, he, he has done that. The nominees have all been from the East um, so far. Uh, I do think regional balance is very important. Um, in addition to diversity generally, uh, regional diversity is important. And Governor Baker has come out publicly and has indicated that regional balance to him is important. So I'm expecting, and I think Western Mass is expecting, Governor Baker to uh, nominate somebody at least with the next two appointments, one of the next two appointments at least, uh, to be from the West. Uh, I've gone back over it. I've looked at the history. And historically, since you know the 1700s, 1800s, Western Massachusetts has always had at least one representative on the Supreme Judicial Court. And it's important because the people from the West are different in so many ways than, than, than the residents uh, that are in the East. The issues, the values are different. So I think it's important when, you have a, when you're making large societal decisions to have somebody who understands what people from the West are like, what people from Franklin County are like, what you know, Berkshire County, Hampshire County, Hamden County, they're all different in their own, in their own little ways. The governor's council is a largely reactive body. In other words, the, the governor comes in with a, a series of appointees and you guys have to advise and consent. Um, is there a way, do you think, as a governor's council, you can not only impact how the appointment appointment happens, but who he decides to choose? Yes, I do. I do believe in that. Uh, one of the things that I've done as uh, president of the Hamden County Bar Association is to do reach out um, when there is an open application. And what I mean by reach out is go into the legal community, try to identify and locate people that would be or might make great judicial applicants, and encourage them to apply. Um, I think what I find, what the governor's office finds, is that sometimes uh, the best candidates don't apply 
And so if you don't get the best in, you can't get the best out. Right. And so can you make an impact? Yes, but that's how. You really need to go out and do reach out and try to get um, the best candidates to apply. And that means you know, starting somewhere in the beginning to the middle of, of a lawyer's career. You want to get those people thinking about those good lawyers, those great lawyers, thinking about becoming judges um, early on in their career and encouraging them that um, it's a great public service and something that they'd be great at. But you know as well as I do that the majority of judges that come are brought forward, the judicial nominees, are politically connected. They either know somebody in the legislature or somebody in the administration. It's A lot of times it's there's a little bit of cronyism that goes along here. I mean, how can the governor's council sort of be a check on that? Well, it, it's going to be a check if I'm the governor's council. As you indicated, I don't have a political history. I don't owe political favors. I don't have political connections. Um, I'm new to the process, and I have been brought up my entire life, and I firmly believe um, in merit-based decisions. And I'm going to make that very clear to the governor that if I believe that somebody is coming through the system and they're getting there not based on merit, um, that there were significantly more qualified people that were part of the application process or more qualified people part of the application process that weren't brought forward, I'm going to want to know why. Um, and I'm not going to vote in favor of people that I believe are not the most qualified based on merit. And if I see that it's um, something's based on politics, I'm going to be public about it. It's not, going to, it's not going to scare me away. Certainly your opponent is very political. She's received a number of endorsements and uh, clearly seems to be connected. Do you think that that is a negative? I mean, ultimately it's a political process, yes, but does the fact that you're an outsider give you an edge in a way to bring a fresh perspective that maybe your opponent wouldn't? It should, and I hope, that, I hope the voters uh, recognize that it should. We can't have, uh, we can't go back to the political, the political connections, political patronage, uh, political favors for these appointments. It's, it's, gotta be, it's gotta be based on merit. And really, uh, even though this is an elected position, I don't see it, I don't see it as political. If I thought that this was a, a, a political, political type position, um, maybe I would be different. Maybe I would think a little bit harder about whether I ran, but I, I see this as a professional position. And that's what I am. Um, I'm a professional. It happens to be that, that this is an elected office. It covers a, a very wide area, as you know. Um, but it's professional. We're trying to get the best people onto the bench that are going to impact uh, and make a difference in our community. I want to talk about the geographical part of it because this is one of the few elected positions that represents all four western counties. Franklin, Hampshire, Hamden, and Berkshire counties. Four counties that don't always jibe in terms of what they view as priorities. Uh, you're based in Hamden County, Hurley's based in Hamden County, but there are three relatively rural counties that you know you may not know much about. How do you handle that? How do you go about getting elected and getting your name out there in, in such a wide geographic area? Well, uh, you, you really need help and you need resources. You need good people to help get your name out. But what's important, um, obviously in the election, it's important to get your name out there and get associated with the position. But here I've, I've done a lot of reach out um, over the last year, way you know, significantly prior to even deciding to, to run for this office. I've developed deep um, and great connections with the other bar association presidents, Rich Dahoney in the Berkshires, Leslie Powers here in Franklin County, Marissa Elkins in Hampshire County, and we have worked very closely over the last year. I helped to bring all of us together. And so I understand uh, and can appreciate the differences uh, between, in the, between Franklin, Berkshire, Hampshire, and Hamden County when it comes to judges and when it comes to the court system. And I'm a firm believer that any judge that takes the bench has to understand the community that he or she is going to be sitting in. Because there are, you know, for example, if you take the pipeline issue, um, that was a tremendously important issue that brought out a lot of people to the court and asked, had them ask that question, who is the judge? You know, that issue was near and dear to so many people's hearts, but especially in Berkshire County, especially in Franklin County. In Hamden County, not nearly as much. You didn't see the publicity. You didn't see the people coming out. Um, it wasn't I, going through their backyard either. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of NIMBY going on there too. But, but that's exactly it, right? So I, I think that a, a judge who was sitting in, you know, a judge who's sitting in Berkshire County Superior Court hearing that decision 
if that judge is from Hamden County, you know, maybe that judge doesn't quite get it the same way as the judge who had connections to Berkshire County, either practiced there for a significant period of time, grew up there, had family there. You need, you need those roots, I think, to understand the community and the issues. Some might also argue, though, it might be better to have somebody from outside of Berkshire County on the bench in that case because they aren't necessarily going to be inflamed by, by personal bias or geographic bias. If someone is living in Berkshire County, they may have a different view on that and may not be as impartial as someone from another part of the state. Yeah, I don't think it's, um, I, I think a judge who takes the bench needs to, needs to be impartial and will be impartial. They take the oath uh, to be impartial and biased, but it's the understanding um, and the appreciation of the importance and of the people, the importance of the issue and the, and the, and the importance of the people and understanding their background. I think that's the important thing. Um, I, I wouldn't expect a judge to be biased or, or make a decision uh, based on bias in any way if uh, that's not a judge that I would put on the bench. But I do want the judge to have a deep and full understanding um, of the issue and the problem. As a practicing lawyer, you've been in every one of these counties. You've, you've, you've practiced law. You've had cases in all four western counties. Um, you've never been a judge, but you've been on the other side of the, of the bench, so to speak. Um, does that give you an advantage? And what have you learned in your time in the courts in these four counties that makes you pr best prepared for this job? I think that's a, that's a distinguishing difference between me and my opponent. Uh, my opponent for the last 18 or so years has been sitting in one court in one county, Chicopee District Court, uh, presiding as a judge. Uh, on the other hand, I have been representing the people. Um, and I have represented the people from Hamden, Hampshire, Franklin, and Berkshire County, all four counties. Uh, and I have represented people in every court in Massachusetts, from the Supreme Judicial Court, the Appeals Court, Superior Court, District Court, Housing Court, Probate and Family Court, Federal Court. I have been, um, I have been all over Massachusetts and all over these counties representing the people. Um, so I, I think that is a distinguishing difference to me. It, you know, it, it sounds like well, one person's a judge, so they should be able to pick a judge. Well, if the case was about who's better prepared to pick a judge for Chicopee District Court, I would probably agree. I would probably agree that um, my opponent uh, is better prepared to pick for that particular court because she's been there for 18 years. But when it comes to all of these other courts, which is really what this job is about, it's judges from all over in every court. Um, I have significantly more experience than she does. Um, and I, I believe that I'm more qualified to do this job. There are a lot of judicial vacancies in the Western region, and I think that y your opponent has talked about this, and I want to give you a chance to, to discuss it because, you know, the old saying goes, justice delayed is justice denied, and if you have a huge docket and you have a long waiting list for people being able to go in front of a judge because there's no judge to go in front of, that's problematic. What can you as a governor's counselor do to put more pieces, people on those benches in those slots that are empty? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. One, you can work closely with the governor to uh, let the governor know about the vacancies that exist and the problems that, are, that exist in the courts out in the four western counties and try to encourage the governor to fill more, position, fill more positions out here. Um, that's one thing you can do. One of, one of the problems is, is that there's a statutory cap that's been in existence for hundreds, you know, for hundreds of years that uh, you can't get around. So it's going to take the legislators to change the statutory cap of 158 district court judges. So at no time can you have more than uh, the 158 judges. But I will work uh, hard to advocate for those here in Western Massachusetts. And, you know, my opponent has had, you know, 18 years on the bench and, you know, not complaining about it, not really moving, not really moving that process forward, you know, was part of, um, it was part of politics for a long time and, and didn't complain about it or do anything about it. I I'm going to try to get that done, get these positions out here filled. Uh, the ones that need to be filled as, as fast as we can. Does the party politics get in the way? In other words, you're a very progressive Democrat and you're going, you know, you have a Republican governor. Does the fact that you're not a member of his party, and ideologically you probably are polar opposites, does that get in the way of, of being able to be a voice? I, I don't think so because it's about the community. Um, it's, it's a larger issue. It's about the community. So the court system uh, is not biased towards who's walking in the door, whether it be a Republican or a Democrat. Um, so to work with the governor, I think the issue is not about, you know, who's getting a political benefit here, a, a progressive Democrat on the governor's council. It's really a larger issue. It's who's getting the benefit. It's the community at large. 
um, and that covers Republicans, independents, those unenrolled, those with no political views, all of the people using the court system. Um, and if it's inefficient out here, uh, the governor should be made aware of it and should attempt to try and do the best that, that he can to, to fix the problem. It's important to point out that it's not just judges and Supreme Court justices that the governor counsel you know, sits in judgment of. There's parole board, there's the appellate tax board, the industrial accident board, the industrial accident review board, notaries, justice of the pieces. I mean, how do you know who are good choices for all those varying positions? I mean, it's a lot of different uh, of knowledge you have to have. It, it is, and you've got to have, um, you know, what I would look at, you know, there are some general things and then there are some specific things. So I'd start with sort of what I would call the prerequisites. You got to have the education, the experience, the work ethic, the temperament um, in order to be a judge. Um, but it's more than that. Um, I'm looking for judges that have that and then have, then are thoughtful, are caring, are good listeners, and are compassionate. Um, I, I think those things are what distinguishes a good judge uh, from a great judge. Um, and it really depends on you know, what the position is. I think the job of a probate and family court um, judge in Hamden County is significantly different than a housing court judge um, in Berkshire County, which is different than uh, somebody who's sitting on the Department of Industrial Accidents Board. So there are different qualities depending upon the position. It's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Would you, as a governor's counselor, have a legislative agenda? I, mean, I know that Michael Albano, who you would succeed if you get this job, uh, for example, lobbied hard on behalf of certain pieces of legislation, one of which dealt with uh, strip searching female prisoners at, uh, at, at jails. Uh, he was very passionate about that and passionate about a number of things. Are there specific areas of legislative action you would like to see pursued? I don't see it as a as a political position and for you know changing le changing le legislation to the extent that um, I could be in a supportive role for something that the constituents wanted um, that was pretty much unanimous I, I, I could and would be able to do that the position doesn't call for that we have legislator legislature legislators yeah. that are elected right. to do exactly that and uh, I don't think that the people are electing a governor's council governor's council member to go out and enact legislation, try to move legislation, legislation through, um, that's, for your, uh, that's for your legislators. But should there be a relationship between the 8th District Councilor and the, de the delegation from Western Mass, seeing as how you know, you're both dealing with a lot of the same issues and judicial appointments are probably the most important thing a governor does is appointing judges. I mean, that's the single, I think, statutorily the most important thing any chief executive could do. Should there not be some kind of a connection with them? There, there would be a connection to the extent that there was legislation or an issue that impacted the courts, the administration of justice, um, then, there's going to be, then there's going to be some crossroads. But um, I think other than that, th there's really not. I mean, for example, um, in Hamden County, uh, we have a, a very old uh, courthouse, very old Hall of Justice, which is in dire need of repair. So, you know, where the, the, that affects the judges, that affects probation officers, clerk magistrates, it affects every, it affects all the citizens, anybody using that courthouse. It's, it's not only uh, old and not working right, it's unsafe. Yeah. So in a situation like that, where the, legis where the uh, legislators are trying to move some things through, um, you can be a, a supporting advocate as a governor's counselor for something like that. But, you know, when it comes to legalizing marijuana or other issues like that, I, I don't think a governor's counselor really um, should be having really any say in that. There are some, I think, that view the governor's council as somewhat arcane. In fact, there's a columnist that once called it a relic of colonial government, that in, it sort of needs to go the way of the dinosaur. And there have been some political figures, luckily, that, that have expressed similar feelings do you feel like this is still a relevant body? And, and, and I guess if you're running for it, you must feel that way. I, I do. I think it's a very, it's a very important position. Um, it provides, it is currently the only office that provides a check and balance on the governor, whoever that may be. I mean, right now it's Governor Baker. You don't know who that's going to be, you know, in four years, eight years, ten years. So there needs to be a check and balance. So unless there's a different system in place to provide that check and balance, then uh, I think you need the governor's council position. 
Uh, the last thing that we want, the last thing, is to have elected judges. Yeah. That doesn't work. It does not allow you to get the best. Um, there is no check and balance. Um, it, it, that's a really bad system. So unless somebody comes up with a better system to provide a check and balance, then you need the governor's counselor. Uh, your, the judges and the council play an important role in that check and balance to make sure that we get the best judges that are, that are helping the community. This is not a full-time position. You're in Boston one day a week, and I'm sure there's other parts of the job you're not tending to. Are you going to be able to maintain your legal practice and still do this job? Yeah, it's a cut down. Um, it's a sacrifice. I've done it over the last year as president of the Hamden County Bar Association. It's taken up a, a tremendous amount of my time, but I feel like I've done a lot. So as that comes to an end, uh, I'm hopefully going to be picking up this governor's council role, and I will be in Boston um, on Wednesdays for whatever happens to take place. And there is, there is also work to be done in between. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to do your vetting uh, of the candidates. It's, you don't just show up on Wednesday and take a look at it. You got to review the applications. You got to look out to the community. You got to do a lot of reach out in order to do a proper vetting of a candidate. So will I have time? I, I will have time. I'll make the time. I've, I've got a busy practice, but I'm very fortunate to have a uh, very supporting family and very supporting law partners as well. Primary election day is the first Thursday in September, and in this particular case, the primary is the general because there is no Republican opponent. So whoever wins this primary is going to have a smooth sailing into November. You can sit back and watch the fireworks of the Trump-Clinton race. Uh, Jeff Morneau is my guest. He is running for governor's council. He's a Democrat. Good luck, and uh, we'll see how it goes, and hopefully we'll get you and Hurley together to do some debates. That would be a fantastic thing to do. I know it's been a challenge to get that done. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting that done. Chris, thanks again for having me in, and um, again, I ask all of you, anybody listening and watching, to uh, support me and hopefully vote for me on Thursday, September 8th. Thanks again. He's Jeff Morneau. He's a candidate for governor's council on the Democratic side. I'm Chris Collins, and that's Beacon Hill Update. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.